Hey everybody, welcome back to A Matter of Life and Made in the Podcast of the Beast. I am Joe Labriola. And on today's episode, episode 26, we're going to talk about the best song groupings going through the Maiden albums. Now when I do this, I want to talk about how the album opens and how it closes and the best groupings and how it flows. So it's kind of going to be based on listenability to a certain extent and a certain degree. Um, Basically, you can't cut songs out. That's the rule. So like starting from the first song to the very last song, how does the record flow? How does it grab you and captivate you and draw you in? Some records have songs where there's a really nice section and target of songs in a row that are excellent, but for the purpose of an album and the listenability factor, how does the album flow from beginning to end? And that's kind of what I'm trying to hit home here and really showcase what I mean by listenability when Matt and I talked about that on the podcast in our earlier episodes. So... I'm going to dive right in here and go with the last, the weakest um, song grouping or selection of songs or how songs line up and stack up against from beginning to end. And for me, that's the record No Prayer for the Dying. Tailgunner is just a weak opener. I don't think it really caps captivates anyone from the beginning, from the get-go. Holy Smoke's catchy, the next song. And No Prayer for the Dying. Those two together are actually pretty good. The way they flow. But then you get Public Enema Number 1. Fate's Warning. The Assassin. Which all are just, in my opinion, just not very good songs. They're mediocre at best. They're actually really weak. Run Silent Run Deep is really good. Hooks in You. Again, kind of boring. Nothing really great about it. Bring Your Daughter is a nice uh, reinvigorator towards the end of the album. But then it falls flat again with Mother Russia. We talked about Mother Russia in some of the earlier episodes I did when I was ranking Steve's epics. And it's just a bad closer. That grouping as a whole, it's just not strong. So in last place, it's uh, the record No Prayer for the Dying. Next on the list is Fear the Dark. That record Be Quick or Be Dead is a great opener, and it goes from here to eternity, which is actually pretty good, into Afraid to Shoot Stranger. So, like, those three at the very beginning are really good. But then you just get... It's almost like bad, good, decent, good, bad, 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 good for Fear of the Dark in the album. So the groupings aren't that great. First three, like I said, that's a pretty decent grouping. Be Quick or Be Dead, like, just flows into From Here Eternity, flows into Afraid to Shoot Strangers. Then you get Fear is the Key, Childhood's End, Wasting Love, Fugitive, Chains of Misery, Apparition, Judas Be My Guide, Weekend Warrior. And then you don't really get an echelon of songs that are on par with, like, Afraid to Shoot Strangers, or even Be Quick or Be Dead, until you get to Fear of the Dark. And that's why this album is just... Again, one of my one of my least favorites. I don't think it's one of the strongest records that Maiden has ever done. So, a nice grouping at the beginning, but then you don't get an echelon like that again until the very last song. I do really like Childhood's End. I think it's a good song. It's catchy, but it's not on that echelon as Be Quick, From Here Eternity, You're Afraid to Shoot Strangers, or Fear of the Dark. And then the rest of the songs on the record just honestly really aren't that great. Wasting Love is kind of catchy. It's kind of a ballad. But it's just, that's what makes Fear of the Dark just, like I said, one of the weaker albums in my opinion. I don't think it's that great. I just think it's a weak record. Moving on from that, Virtual Eleven. Future Real is a really good, catchy, quick opener, just like Be Quick or Be Dead. We talked about Fear of the Dark. Then here's where the flow just stops instantly. It goes right into The Angel and the Gambler. Just this drawn-out, long, consecutive, repetitive chorus that is just not that great. Lightning Strikes Twice and the Clans Man is pretty good. Like, it's a decent a decent thing, but you already killed the flow with Angel and the Gambler. Then after Clans Man, you get When Two Worlds Collide, which, again, it's kind of a lull. 
Educated Fool, I really like. I like that song. But, again, it's broken up then after that by Don't Look to the Eyes of a Stranger, and then it closes with Como Estes Amigos, the record. So the flow is just off. Like, songs that are grouped together just don't roll or flow together or, like, transition into one another uh, uh, the way I would like them to, and they do it, like, masterfully on other albums. But these first three that we talked about, it's just... There's glimmers of hope there for like this nice rolling into one another, grouping songs and listenability factor, but so far it just hasn't been it hasn't been the way I've wanted it to to be. After that is the X Factor. Um, <clears throat> again, much like Fear of the Dark, the first three songs really flow and really uh, work well together. Sign of the Cross is an amazing opener. It's one of the greatest openers on any album. Uh, we'll do a, a ranking of openers probably at some point, I'm sure. But Sign of the Cross, and the Lord of the Flies, and the Man on the Edge, and then, truly, into Fortunes of War. I don't think Fortunes of War is quite is as good as Sign of the Cross, Lord of the Flies. You know, and to a certain extent, it's probably on par. It might be a little bit better than Man on the Edge, actually, but... The first four kind of really flow really well together. And then you get Look for the Truth, which kind of takes it a little bit of a lull. Then the Aftermath. The Aftermath is really good, uh, the way the way that it picks up. And then you get Judgment of Heaven that slows it back down. Then Blood in the World's Hands picks everything back up again. In the Edge of Darkness is pretty good. And then it, the closers are 2 a.m. and the Unbeliever. It's just... A very weak stack of closers at the end, and um, that's kind of what takes the X Factor down a peg. Really solid opening and flow. Like when you put the X Factor on and you get Sonic Cross and the Lord of the Flies and the Man on the Edge and the Fortunes of War, it's like, damn, this album's actually pretty cool. And then you just get a you know a lull. Then there's like a decent song, a lull, a decent song, and then there's like an okay song. And then a lull and a lull to close the album out. That's kind of why it is where it is. But then after the X Factor, which, like I said, is a pretty decent album, you know, from the beginning. But then, you know, much like Fear of the Dark, it kind of just bounces back and forth and back and forth. And uh, the grouping, it's like, like I said at the beginning of this episode, like it's almost like you have a target, and like you're, you know, down at the range, and you're you're shooting and try to hit that bullseye. Um, and Matt and I made this analogy before. Uh, you know, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard. Like, some of the darts are, like, right in the bullseye, and they're amazing songs. Some of them are really close to the bullseye. You know, they're they're damn near perfect. They're not quite there. And then you have some that aren't even on target with some of these records. And I feel like the first couple albums that I talked about in this episode, No Prayer for the Dying, um, Fear of the Dark... Virtual Eleven in particular, and then to a certain extent the X Factor, like they just never really are a complete in terms of like a listenability piece or song groupings where like songs just flow into each other, and you know every song is really close to that bullseye. You don't really get that with these records, and I'm not saying that these records are horrible or they're abysmal. Well, I mean some are. Uh, no Prayer for the Dying and Fear the Dark in particular, are just I don't know, they're just not very good maiden albums. They're at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, Virtual Eleven's a step up. X Factor's a step up from there. But the whole purpose of this episode is to show you the listenability of records and why certain records are, you know, to a certain extent, just better than others. Just how how they are in terms of listenability and what makes an album just so impactful and memorable when you put it in. And you listen, like I said, you can't skip. So you listen from the very beginning to the end. And where are these groupings at, where these bullseyes, bullseyes are at? And it's kind of really cool, and I know I'm going off on a tangent. But it's cool when I do these episodes, and like I'm thinking of this stuff, and I look back on the stuff that Matt and I have done previously, and my experience with Maiden as a fan for 20 years now, of how to you know, really digest their material and listen to it. And I think it's interesting this way because... It makes sense when I do this. It helps me illuminate why I choose things too. And I, granted, like I said, this is my opinion, but 
it's interesting to kind of look at these from this kind of, you know, uh, it's a subjective perspective, but in a way, it's also objective. So, with that being said, coming in after the X Factor, and I know I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, is The Final Frontier. Now, the reason why this album isn't lower on this, you know, song groupings list is because the latter portion of the record makes up for the stuff at the beginning. But going through it here, Satellite 15, The Final Frontier, the beginning kind of grabs you, the Satellite 15 piece, and then it's just like a really short rocker that's, you know, the highlight of it is Adrian and Dave's solos in, 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 this, in this song. It's not a very strong opener. It's a weaker opener. Uh, in El Dorado, again, kind of like a middle-of-the-pack song. It's not super spectacular or great. It's, it's decent. It's good. But it's not anything spectacular. And some of this later stuff we're going to talk about. Then it goes into Mother of Mercy. Then it goes into Coming Home and The Alchemist. And those songs there, this, this is kind of why... When I think about reunion albums, I think this one might be the weakest for me, and it's not really my favorite because of that. It's almost like when you look at the, these songs and how they try to go into one another, it's like puzzle pieces, right? And it's almost like you're getting like a circular uh, puzzle piece or a circular hole when you're trying to put a square peg into it, or vice versa. Like It's almost like an identity crisis at the beginning to try to get this album up and running off the ground. But here's why it ascends, and it's a little bit better than some of those previous albums I talked about in, ter in terms of song groupings, and this is why. Because after that kind of mismanagement and like identity crisis at the beginning with Satellite 15, El Dorado, Mother of Mercy, Coming Home, and The Alchemist, when you get to Isle of Avalon, this album is damn near masterful to the end. You get Isle of Avalon, Into Starblind, Into the Talisman. Those three songs alone are just phenomenal. I mean, they're like 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, bullseye right there in the heart of the Target song grouping, that, that section. Into the Man Who Would Be King, which is, you know, a little bit of a step down from Isle of Avalon, Starblind, and Talisman, but still a damn good song, you know, it's like a strong eight and a half, nine. it's not bad, it's a really good song, and it's different for them, In the When the Wild Wind Blows, again, a nice eight and a half, nine to finish out the album, that latter portion is why the Final Frontier is in the spot above the X Factor, and why it's not at the end, uh, with No Prayer, Fear, and Virtual Eleven, just because of that that ending that really, really ties the album together. It's almost like, man, like you're anticipating when a great song is going to come up. And it's not that, you know, Coming Home, The Alchemist, El Dorado are bad songs, but like they're more in that like six and a half, seven, maybe seven and a half echelon of songs. You don't get a really good nine or nine and a half out of ten until you get out of Avalon. And then it's just boom, 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 all the way down to the closer when the wild wind blows. So a really good finale in terms of a grouping. But then again, that's only half the album. So you get five songs in a row that are just, you know, really solid and fit together really well. And then five at the beginning that are just like, strangers to each other they just don't flow they don't sync up like or flow into each other correctly it's just it just seems weird but that's why that's where it's at coming in after the final frontier is going to be killers now killers is kind of unique with this because killers when you put it in and you hear those first couple riffs to Ides of March, and then it goes into Wrathchild, into Murders of the Room Morgue. Like, those three songs in a row are amazing. I mean, I can't... I remember when I first heard Ides of March, I was like, damn, this is awesome. And then you find out it's an instrumental. It's really short, 
but it's a really sweet opener that goes into Rat Child. And then a really cool, distinct turn with Murders of the Room Morgue. You know, as opposed to like Final Frontier, like I talked about, there is no identity crisis here. Like these three songs flow perfectly together at the beginning. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky with Killers, because then you go into Another Life, and again, just Khan, which is an instrumental, then Innocent Exile. It's not that those three don't flow together, but it's almost like they're just not upper echelon songs. They're not super high-level, intriguing, captivating, draw-you-in like Ides of March, Rat Child, Murders in the Room Morgue. You don't get that until the next song when it comes back to Killers, which is just this really interesting, new, kind of flashy, progressive song for the time. And then you get Prodigal Son, which, again, it's kind of a slow burn. It doesn't really have another gear. It's just kind of, like, flat. It never... It's safe. It's safe, and it's it just stays where it's at. It's adequate. It doesn't take a big risk. Now, I dig it. I think it's really cool, but... Again, it's just not at the echelon of Killers or the first three songs on the record. Then you get Purgatory, which is a great song. I love Purgatory. It's probably my favorite song on the record. But I feel like it probably should have been closer to the beginning. It should have came after Murders in the Room Morgue. Then you would have had four songs in a row that just, you know, destroyed. Then you get Twilight Zone, which is great. And then you get Drifter as a closer. And, like, that's that's kind of where this album falls short. It's like, the thing about Killer is why it's hard to rank is because, and I've said this before on the podcast, it's not Maiden's identity. It's not really who Maiden is. It's really quick, really short songs that are trying to be built around Paul Dionne's vocal because he could do this kind of stuff. And he had a lot of writing credits on this with Steve. The most, the most in the band that he ever did were on Killers, right? So it just... It's not who Maiden is and their identity. It's almost like it's almost like you have to kind of look at this in a different way than you would the rest of the Maiden catalog because it is just so different of an album. But that's what makes it cool, too. That's always why Killers kind of comes in like on my ranking and a lot of people I see or talk to who are Maiden fans, like friends, family, people I see at concerts or people I bump into like when I'm out in the world walking around. You know, it's if we talk about Maiden, it's almost like Killers is either in the middle of the pack um, or, you know, closer to the high end for a lot of people. I never really see Killers, you know, near the bottom. It's be- because it is really, it's different. And I'm not trying to compare, you know, Iron Maiden to any punk bands or anything like that, but it almost has like this bluesier, punky or punkier feel to it. Not that it is blues or punk, but it almost has like a Dan Ziggy kind of vibe to it. Uh, if that makes any sense. Like a typo negative Dan Ziggy kind of feel, like a punky or kind of feel to it, um, and that's what that's what you get. I mean, with Paul on this too, with some of the songs, it's a very like more bluesier vocal, which I love Paul's voice, but this is where they really capitalize on it. And I think for what it is, it's cool. It's just not Maiden. It's just not Maiden, and that's why it is where it is. After Killers is the debut album, the original album, uh, Iron Maiden. This album is where, you know, this level of albums goes up even another tier. Because I think from Iron Maiden onward, this is where we're starting to get into some pretty like high-end territory. Really good song groupings throughout as a whole and a really good organization of songs. This is where the albums start to become like more epic in scope and design, and they're masterful in terms of a ranking standpoint. Like I said before, uh, not that Maiden had an identity crisis, but you know, Iron Maiden, the original album, is Steve's baby. Like that's him putting all the ideas he had thought about for five or six years or more out there. For the world to see and he wanted to make sure it was you know epic shit and then he took more of a risk with killers uh he was kind of leaning on paul to have some input and try to build the band around him to a certain extent a little bit 
with this more speedier, punkier, faster, you know, you know, even thrash, if you want to think about it, it's like a thrashier kind of feel, but it just wasn't Maiden, and as you see how Maiden has evolved over the years since Bruce joined the band, uh, and the first album they released with him was Number of the Beast, they've become more of a progressive band, a progressive metal band, um, so, and that's, that's what Iron Maiden really is, the first record, it's the debut, and it's, the album that has a little bit of everything, I mean, I love it. People complain about the production sometimes, but I still think, much like I said about Killers, this one falls in the middle of the pack a lot for me and with people I talk to. You know, people who are, like, huge fans of Paul obviously love this and Killers the most, and, you know, the most people I talk to who are fans of Paul like Killers more because it is more in Paul's vein. It's in Paul's style. You know, it's built for him. Where I mean is more Steve style. It's more Steve's pace. It's more like the, you know, the Argus album by Wishbone Ash and like, you know, earlier Toll stuff and that kind of feel of like prog that you get. So like, it makes sense. It makes sense uh, why people would think that Killers would be slightly, you know, more favorable for Paul because it truly is. I mean, if you listen to it. But with that being said, when you first put in Iron Maiden, you get hit with Prowler, which is an amazing riff roar and opening track, nice rocker, right in the Sanctuary, a samey kind of feel to Prowler, I don't think it's quite as proggy as Prowler, or quite as captivating as Prowler, but it's it's catchy nonetheless, and it flows really well from Prowler, then from Sanctuary, it goes right into Remember Tomorrow, which is a nice little turn, it's a slower paced song, but it has a lot of really heavy, doomy qualities to it, which I love, uh, it reminds me of like early Sabbath, um, and a lot of, in a lot of parts, which, which is killer. I think it's an amazing track. I'd love to see Remember Tomorrow Live. It's one song I haven't seen yet. It'd be awesome to see. And the Running Free, which goes back to that kind of like really fast, thrashy, punkier feel to it, like speed metal sort of, which I dig. I think it's awesome. They, they flow really well together. And then it goes into Phantom of the Opera. So like the first five songs on the original Iron Maiden album are pretty damn good. I mean, we're talking about with Phantom, obviously, that's a 10. Prowler Sanctuary, Remember Tomorrow, and Running Free are all in that kind of like 7.5 to 8.5 range uh, for me. And then you get hit with the bullseye with Phantom of the Opera. So it's almost like you have a gun and you're shooting at a target. You're, you're really close to the bullseye the first time. You're like on the outer ring. Then you get even closer, even closer, even closer. And then when you get to Phantom, you're like, boom, I got it. My sights are set. And I love the first five because they are like perfectly flowing together that way. Just a majestic opening five, which is awesome. And then even in the Transylvania, you know, the thing about Transylvania is you don't get to hear any vocals. And I love Maiden as a band when they have vocals. That's why they've only done a few instrumentals. They've only done two or three instrumentals, three, I believe, you know, uh, Transylvania, Ides of March, and then Lost for Words, Big Aura on Power Slave, and that was the last one they did. Why? Because vocals are important to Maiden. Like, I want to hear someone sing. And uh, Transylvania is a hell of an instrumental, though. It's amazing. It's one of the best, you know, heavy metal instrumentals of all time. But again, that's kind of a step down from this amazing opening echelon of tracks and this amazing grouping at the beginning. Then it goes in a strange world, which is great. Then again, this is where it starts to kind of turn into like the other albums. It goes in a strange world, which is a great song, you know, eight, eight and a half. Then you get Charlotte the Harlot, which is probably the worst song on the record. That's like a seven out of ten. I just don't think it's that great of a song. Maybe a six and a half. I, it's, it's the, it's the weakest part of the album for me. And then you get Iron Maiden. I love Iron Maiden. I think it's a great song and it's a cool closer. But again, it never reaches the echelon of Phantom of the Opera. Or even Remember Tomorrow. I think Phantom of the Opera and Remember Tomorrow are the two best songs on the record. Phantom of the Opera is obviously the best. But Iron Maiden is like in that nice 8, 8.5 echelon too to close it out, which is really cool. So for this album uh, to be where it's at, you know, this is kind of where it starts to get to that place where it's like, hey, we're going to have a really cool, epic closer on this record. And we're going to make sure we you know, give people stuff at the beginning, too, to draw them in, captivate them, and grab their attention. Again, I go back to Final Frontier. There was a nice closer on that record with When the Wild Wind Blows, and the last five songs on that flow really well together, but 
the thing about that album that really takes a toll on that record and takes a lot of points off of it in terms of like song groupings or listenability is that just the first five songs are just mismatched and there's almost an identity crisis like I said and they just don't flow well together at all it's like you're missing puzzle pieces like you can't figure out how to put things together and Iron Maiden doesn't do that Iron Maiden is probably the first example where the songs are really really close and the song groupings are great throughout there might be one or two lulls but for the most part the record as a whole is just fantastically listenable yeah and like I said with Iron Maiden the album it's just that great of a record and uh, as mentioned it's it's the first example of like a really concrete fully complete listenable album with just a few lulls here and there now I know I talked about uh, the Final Frontier record so we're gonna go to this next one which is in a way very similar to the Final Frontier except it's good at the beginning and kind of um, falters towards the end and that album is Seventh Son of a Seventh Son where the Final Frontier had this amazing stack of closers but the beginning was a lull you know it was kind of hard to get through those first uh, five songs there was really no synergy there um, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son is the opposite like the first five songs are completely synergistic like they flow perfectly into each other and they just grow and grow and grow you get this really killer opener with Moonchild that's amazing it's a it's a fantastic opener it's a really good opener it's you know uh, I don't want to say it's the best opener they've ever done but it's definitely a solid opener um, and probably makes it into the top 10 or you know maybe the top five uh, if we ever do ranking openers down the line here but Moonchild is just so good and it flows perfectly into Infinite Dreams. Infinite Dreams is my favorite song on the album, my personal favorite, um, just for what it means to me and uh, what the song actually conveys and what it's about. But Moonchild and Infinite Dreams flow perfectly into each other. And truly, into Can I Play With Madness, Can I Play With Madness is probably the weakest, one of the weakest songs on the record. But it's grown on me a lot over the years, um, and I really like it, and I think it's really catchy, and truly, again, that song flows perfectly into The Evil That Men Do, which is an amazing, you know, middle range, shorter rocker, whatever you want to call it, uh, and then into the title track, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. So you're getting these, you know, pretty good to great to awesome songs with the first five moonchild again i mean it's not a 10 out of 10 i don't think but it's damn near it's like in that eight and a half nine range infinite dreams in that nine range can i play with madness maybe a little bit you know lesser and maybe like a seven and a half eight but still a good song back to the evil that men do in that nice eight eight and a half range and then seventh son you know it's like a nine a nine range, a nine and a half range. It's uh, the the beginning is really good. Now here's what lacks with seventh son of a seventh son in terms of song groupings. Then you get the prophecy, which is not quite as good as those first five. The clairvoyant, which takes it back up again, you know, a notch. And then the closer, only the good die young. Um, Prophecy is probably like a 7 out of 10 song, maybe a 7.5. Clairvoyance in that vein too, probably a 7.5 or an 8 on a good day. And then Only the Good Die Young is right around, I don't know, I give that like a 7 or 7.5 as well. The thing about the last three songs are, you, like I said, you're building at the beginning. You're going from like this nice, you know, 8, 8.5, 9, 9.5. And then you're getting these last three that are just a step down. So when you close the record out, the ending songs just don't live up to the first five. And it's not that they're bad songs, it's just... when you, I'm talking about listenability factor and like a full, complete album. 
where you're captivated entirely throughout from beginning to end. You know, it's almost like I'd rather have a lull here and there as opposed to like three or four songs in a row that just don't, you know, grab me or draw me in as much as the first couple songs on the record. And if you listen to the podcast, and I don't want to do too much of a deep dive here in The Seventh Son, but, you know, from the 80s with with Bruce as the lead singer, the Bruce era 80s stuff, um, Seventh Son is my, my least favorite record. I like all the other stuff more. Um, and this is a personal opinion. And like, like I said, this is probably one of the reasons why um, some of the positioning on here just isn't isn't that memorable or captivating i mean and i'm just going to kind of spitball here to look at it and kind of reconstruct it i would keep everything the same from moonchild all the way down to the evil that men do and then i'd probably put i don't know only the good die young after the evil that men do and then probably the clairvoyant then the prophecy and then close it out with seven son of a seventh son I mean, I, I don't know. I just I just feel like the epic closer, and I know we're not ranking closers here, but in terms of song groupings and a listenability thing, Only the Good Die Young kind of falls short of an epic closer for this record. So that's where Seven Son of a Seven Son is with me. I, I, I love it because the first five songs really kind of what to echo what I said about Iron Maiden, the record I reviewed previously, um, in the previous position to this, just, this is a really good mix up front, and the reason I put it slightly above, uh, the Iron Maiden album is just because of that amazing stack of openers in a row. Iron Maiden does the exact same thing, but... I just feel like Seventh Son is a little bit more polished, a little bit more proggy, has some deeper instrumentation on there that I dig, and um, that's why it is where it's at for me on this. Now, moving on from Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, the next album, I might get some flack for this, but uh, the next album... For me, in terms of a listenability standpoint, drawing you in from beginning to end is the number of the beast. And I hate to put it here because it is such an amazing album, but the thing that kills this record for a listenability standpoint, like from the beginning to the end, not skipping a song, is the opening with Invaders. Like right from the beginning, you're not getting this really captivating song and matt and i talked about this on the podcast even when we reviewed the listenability piece for uh the number of the beast it you get bruce dickinson this new singer and the first song that he sings that people everybody's going to hear is invaders now don't get me wrong the album you know has a big payoff and we're talking about the extended edition here the special edition that has the Total Eclipse added to it, the nine-track version. Everything after that truly is pretty damn amazing. Until, I mean, there's a couple lulls. Until you get to Gangland. Gangland's probably, I don't know, in my opinion, probably the weakest song on the album. I think I like Invaders a tad more. They're, they're really close to each other. They're interchangeable. Children of the Damned. Into the Prisoner, into 22 Acacia Avenue, into the Number of the Beast, into Run of the Hills. That run right there with those, I don't know, what is that, five songs? Is absolutely incredible. Like, we're talking about nine, nine and a half, ten stuff. Um, all the way through that thing. And then you get the lull with Gangland, and then you're getting at the end a nice eight and a halfer with Total Eclipse into a ten with How Would Be That Name. It's just incredible. Um, but like I said, from the get go, you're getting that Invaders, which just slams it, just slams it, and takes it down a peg to to leave it where it's at right now. 
but structurally there's not much I could change with this for listenability. The only the only lulls on it, in my opinion, are Invaders and Gangland. Every other song is I mean, just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, but just that opener from beginning to end, if you're talking about listenability, Invaders just as soon as you put it in, it just doesn't have that captivating power that Children of the Damned has. Or The Prisoner, or 22 Acacia, or MOTB, or Run of the Hills. So, that's kind of where this stumbles a little bit. But, it's arguably the greatest heavy metal record of all time, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, but, in terms of what we're talking about here, song groupings, from beginning to end, that thing just, the Invaders, is just that blemish. That and Gangland. The rest of the album is pretty much damn near flawless. And you know, when we rank this, we give it like a 9.5 out of 10, just because it's damn near perfect. The blemishes, Invaders and Gangland, are what hold it back from being a perfect 10. Uh, with Without those songs on it, or even if you cut Invaders or Gangland and didn't make it an 8-song album, um, it would be a perfect 10, in my opinion. But, or at least... In a higher nine, you know, nine point seven, nine point eight. Um, but yeah, that's what Number of the Beast is. One of the greatest, one of the greatest records of all time. Coming in after the Number of the Beast, Dance of Death. Now, I'm not saying that Dance of Death is better than Number of the Beast or any of the albums before, but Again, listenability, song groupings, how songs flow into each other, putting puzzle pieces together. Going back to Number of the Beast again, Invaders and Children of the Damned just didn't link up. There's that instantaneous lull at the beginning with Invaders. Now with Dance of Death, it opens up with Wildest Dreams, which is a really decent, you know, opener. It's not incredible, it's not amazing, it's probably not one of the best, but it's good. It's a good opener, and it goes really well into Rainmaker. That flows really well into No More Lies, flows really well into Monsagore, and flows really well into Dance of Death. Again, really good, strong opening section for Dance of Death. Uh, five songs in a row that are really good, and that seven and a half to eight and a half, and then like a nine or so, with like Dance of Death, I don't think Dance of Death's a perfect song, but definitely nine, at least a nine. Um, so going through all that stuff, it's just pretty damn good. It's a really strong opening section. Now after that, you get a lull with two songs. So these groupings are two in a row now where you're kind of like, eh, they're kind of lackluster. Gates Tomorrow and New Frontier. Then you get two in a row that are really good. Passchendaele is a 10 out of 10. That's a perfect song. Face in the Sand, another strong, like, eight and a half song. Then you get a lull with Age of Innocence. That's not that great. And then a nice, really solid closer with Journeyman. I really like Journeyman on the closing position. I wouldn't change that. And honestly, the, the way this album is stacked is pretty damn good. It's hard for me to to say that this is a bad listenability album. You know, there's a couple lulls on it with Gates Tomorrow, New Frontier, and Age of Innocence. But really, if you pull those three, like if you were to listen to this record and you pull those three, or even if you knocked off, I don't know, Age of Innocence, and you just had that little lull with Gates Tomorrow and New Frontier, and then it was Passchendaele, Facing the Sand, and Journeyman in a row... I mean, that's a pretty damn good stack of closers in terms of listenability. So you get five at the beginning that are amazing, two little lulls, and then three amazing closers. That with, with the way it, the album actually is, you get a lull with Gates Tomorrow and New Frontier. You get this amazing Passion Dell and Face in the Sand tandem or grouping. And then you get a lull with Age of Innocence, and then you close out with Journeyman. 
and it kind of messes up the flow. It doesn't flow the way it should. You know, and they don't they don't really sync up together. And we get to some of these higher ranked albums that I'm going to talk about. You're going to see what I'm talking about with flow and how songs just really flow into one another. Um, but as it stands and where it's at, I think Dance of Death is going to be in that position for now. After Dance of Death, we're going to go back to the 80s again, and uh, we're going to look at arguably the greatest Maiden album of all time, and that's uh, that's Power Slave. As everyone knows who's listened to the podcast, Matt and I worship Power Slave. We both give it a 10 out of 10. It's a perfect album. Now, that takes everything in consideration. That takes, you know, the songwriting, the credits, the listenability, the artwork, the live performance, all, all that stuff, right? But in terms of a song grouping standpoint, and it's not necessarily even a blemish, this is just a personal opinion, the thing about Power Slave, in terms of listenability, now I listen to it from beginning to end because I worship the record, like I said, it's one of my favorite albums of all time, but much like I talked about when I talked about uh, Number of the Beast, where Invaders was the opener that didn't draw you in, Power Slave has, in my opinion, the best tandem opener and closer on any Maiden album, and that's the two tandems at the beginning of Aces High and Two Minutes to Midnight, and the tandem closers of Power Slave and Ram the Ancient Mariner. I mean, that's some of the best openings and closings of all time. However, from beginning to end, when you get to Lost for Words, Big Aura, the instrumental on the record, it's an amazing instrumental. Here's the thing. Do I think it's as good as Transylvania or Ides of March? I, I think it's on par musically, but in terms of like favorites, I like Ides of March and Transylvania better than Lost for Words, Big Aura. It's my least favorite instrumental they've ever done. I'm not saying it's... It, and they've only done three, so... Not that I hate the song. I think it's amazing, but... You're getting... Ace is high flows in a two minutes to midnight absolutely flawlessly like i said probably the best tandem openers on any maiden album ever then you get lost for words which is an instrumental you don't get bruce you don't get any vocals then it goes into flash of the blade and the duelist which are again a really good tandem together flash of the blade into the duelist is absolutely amazing then you get back in the village, which is kind of a unique turn, which is really good, and then into the two closers, Power Slave and Ron the Ancient Mariner. The thing about Power Slave that holds this back from being like the top in terms of a song grouping standpoint is Lost for Words Big Aura. Like, I give Power Slave a perfect 10 because of all the stuff I've talked about in the podcast episodes. Go back and listen to Matt and I's review of Power Slave, my personal opinions about a lot of the songs, all that stuff. My experiences with Somewhere Back in Time where they did like a modern day world slavery tour. Like, you know I love the record and it's one of my favorites. But when I sit here, if I had to give it one criticism, one objective criticism, it would be Lost for Words, Big Aura. I wish it was a song that had vocals on. I wish this wasn't just a seven-song album with the whole band. I wish there was an eighth song on here that Bruce sung on. And it would just be even more immense, in my opinion. As it stands, I love the record. It's, it's incredible. But that Lost for Words for me is the thing that makes this makes this album in terms of a listenability or song grouping standpoint it just could have been like the perfect listenability even if i'm looking at the track listing here and if you were to take lost for words big or out and it was aces high two minutes to midnight in the flash of the blade into the duelist in the back in the village in the power slave and around the ancient mariner perfect absolutely flawless and perfect and that Lost for Words big aura. Not that it's not good. This album flows amazingly well. I just wish there would have been an A song on here for Bruce to sing on. 
And um, I know that in terms of listenability, this this is not you know bad at all. It's not nowhere near the bottom. It's amazing. And these you know these next couple ones, even the couple previously that I reviewed, are all super close from each other in terms of listenability standpoint and song grouping factor. Um, but like, man, another thing about this is. While the openers and the closers, the tandems, Aces High, Two Minutes to Midnight, and Power Slave Around Ancient Mariner are like 10 out of 10 songs, the stuff in the middle, not that it's bad, I mean, it's like 9 out of 10, 8.5, 9 out of 10, but it doesn't rise to the level of those openers and closers. So you, you almost get, again, kind of like, and you throw a loss for words in, you get one, two, three, four songs in the middle there that just don't rise to the level of the tandem openers and the tandem closers. And that's what I want to say about Power Slave in terms of song groupings and listenability. If it wasn't for the tandem opening and the tandem closing of this record, it probably wouldn't be as powerful or as strong. What they did and the way they did it is perfectly I mean, designed for what they, they did. Any song in any other position on this would just not make sense. So it is good the way it is. It's just those four songs in the middle, Lost for Words, Flash of the Blade of the Duelist, and Back in the Village, are a step down from the tandem opener and closers. And that's kind of where it's at. You'll see later when I keep going here and I talk about you know albums that are a little bit better in terms of song grouping, what I mean when I say that. So, that's where Power Slave's at. One of the greatest heavy metal records of all time. Uh, Maiden fans love this record. You know, it's it's that and Number of the Beast. You know, Power Slave and Number of the Beast are probably their most popular albums. Um, and rightfully so. I mean, they're both incredible. But like I said, I'm just given some objective, or my subjective, whatever you want to call it, criticisms here about things in terms of listenability. It has nothing to do with the record. I'm not saying the songs are bad. It's just a listenability standpoint. And when you put this in and you get to Lost for Words, it's like, man, I was just steamrolled at the beginning with those two. What's this? This is unique and it's different. But it is a little bit of a lull for this record. And it slows down the momentum. So that's kind of where it's at. Now, moving onward from Power Slave... Uh, we're going to go back to the uh, the reunion, and we're going to look at the Book of Souls, which, you know, in some ways is almost like a modern-day power slave. Instead of Egyptian culture and civilization, they're looking at Mayan culture and civilization, stage set and everything. Amazing tour. I saw this live. You know, go back and listen to my tour experience podcast episode. Um this is very similar in a lot of ways to Power Slave. With, you know, imagery, stage set, and design. It's based on a civilization and a culture, like I said. But also, the album itself has some of Maiden's longest epics. And you look at Power Slave, Ram the Ancient Mariner was like the huge staple. You know, almost 14, 13 and a half, almost 14 minutes long. And then you get... Book of Souls, and you're getting, you know, The Red and the Black and Empire of the Clouds, their longest song to date, over 18 minutes. Um, now, the reason I put Book of Souls a little bit above Power Slave, and you're going to see this, is just the nature of the reunion stuff in the 2000s onward. It's just Maiden becomes a lot more progressive, and these songs are just more epic in design. And I'm a fan of Epic Maiden. So, for me, instead of getting one rhyme on the Ancient Mariner-like song, on these newer records, you're getting three or four of them per album. And for me, that's amazing. So, that's why a lot of these newer records and Reunion Era albums are higher than some of the 80s stuff. Just because of that. I'm not saying that it's better than the 80s stuff. But as a fan who loves the more epic stuff, I get more of it, so I like it. So that's kind of why these are where they're at. I'm not saying Book of Souls is better than Power Slave, but I do think Book of Souls is a strong album. Now, diving into the record, 
if eternity should fail while it doesn't have a, a great tandem like Power Slave had with Aces High and the Two Minutes to Midnight, If Eternity Should Fail is an amazing opener. It's one of the coolest, most unique openers they've ever done. And since the reunion, it's one of the greatest. I mean, it's one of the best, coolest openers they've ever done. Now, here's where the album starts to lose flow. Because you go from If Eternity Should Fail with all this really cool, almost semi-epicness into Speed of Light, which is this really short rocker. This is where it gets broken up. But from the beginning, you get grabbed in. And it's almost like you don't notice Speed of Light because it comes in right after If Eternity Should Fail. It's almost like you can just like turn a blind eye to it. Like You don't even see it. You can ignore it. It's a really quick rocker. You get it out of the way. Then here's where the album is absolutely amazing. You get The Great Unknown into the red and the black, into when the river runs deep, into the book of souls. Now, if you're listening to this in concession and you're not taking the first CD out and putting the second one in or the second LP or the third LP of a, of a vinyl, whatever you're doing, and you're listening to it all the way through, after the book of souls, you get death or glory and shadows of the valley. That right there, you're getting one, two, three, four, five, six songs in a row. Six songs in a row that are just immense, and they're really, really good. Great Unknowns, like an eight and a half. Red in the Blacks, a ten. When the River Runs Deep, eight, eight and a half. Book of Souls, nine, nine and a half. Death or Glory, eight, eight and a half. Shadows of the Valley, eight. And after that, you get Tears of a Clown and Man of Sorrows, the two lulls on the album. The two weakest songs on the album, Man of Sorrows, Matt and I have said this before, I do not like the song at all. I, I can't really... It's one of the worst songs Maiden has ever done in their entire career. And it's a shame to see it on such a newer album. You know, their second newest that came out in 2015. But then you get this amazing closer with Empire of the Clouds. It makes up for it. It's an amazing closer. This record, in terms of listenability, is damn near perfect. And Matt and I talked about this when we did the Book of Souls episode. Man of Sorrows ruins this record from probably being a 10 because that song and Tears of a Clown are just, you know, not that great. If you took Man of Slayers off of this album, it would be a 10. That's how good this record is. And we're talking about an amazing... And another thing about this is when I talk about tandems, you get Bruce's tandem opener and closer with If Eternity Should Fail, solo penned by Bruce, and Empire of the Clouds, solo penned by Bruce. Amazing. And that's also how it kind of relates to Power Slave. Power Slave had these really two amazing Aces High, Two Minutes to Midnight, some of the most recognizable Maiden anthems ever, and then the amazing closers of Power Slave and Rhyme. You fast forward to 2015, we're talking about mind culture and civilization, we're talking about Bruce's cancer struggle, we're talking about him surviving and coming back stronger than ever and killing it out there. If Eternity Should Fail in Empire of the Clouds. And then all that stuff in between. This record is really damn good. And as a, as a Maiden fan, if you're into Modern Maiden, if you're into Reunion stuff, you gotta listen to this record. Because it it's amazing. It's an amazing record. Besides, like I said, those couple blemishes with Tears of a Clown and Man of Sorrows. Tears of a Clown is listenable, though. It's a weaker song, but... It's still decent. Manasaurus just has no redeeming qualities. It's a bad song, and that's what that's what takes this album down a few pegs. But this record is just phenomenal. Listen to the Book of Souls. It is absolutely stellar stuff. Absolutely stellar. So moving on from the Book of Souls, we're gonna go to somewhere in time. Somewhere in time, again, uh, I just want to say this, the first four songs, were really five, six, six songs in a row, all really flow well together. Now, I'm going to say this, Caught Somewhere in Time is one of the greatest openers of all time in the main catalog, in my opinion. It might be the best, as far as I'm concerned, but like I said, we'll do a ranking down the road. Caught somewhere in time, in the wasted years, in the sea of madness, in heaven can wait, into the loneliness of the long distance runner, 
in the stranger in a strange land now the flow is pretty solid i will say this though loneliness of the long distance runner is a little bit of a hiccup that's kind of where the flow is a little bit choppy i don't think it is a bad flow or a horrible flow or it's you know like it doesn't flow at all i think it flows it's just on a different level in a peg down from the other tracks so the stuff that comes before it like caught somewhere in time wasted years sea of madness and heaven can wait are all really solid tracks that's a bit of a step down and then you get stranger in a strange land which is immense now caught somewhere in time wasted years sea of madness and heaven can wait caught somewhere and wasted years are like the nine nine and a half echelon i mean and, and in some cases they might be a 10 they're in that really strong category sea of madness and heaven can wait are more like eight eight and a half echelon loneliness and long distance runner is about a seven and a half eight maybe on a good day um it's probably the weakest song on the record that or deja vu which we'll talk about here in a second then it comes back up with stranger in a strange land which takes you back to that nine nine and a half maybe even a ten song and then you get Deja Vu, which is a little bit of a lull again. It's in that 7, 7.5 range, maybe an 8. And then you get Alexander the Great, which is an amazing closer, great closer. I mean, that's like a 9 out of 10 song. Um, nothing, I couldn't give it any less than probably a 9, uh, maybe an 8.5, but it's definitely a strong closer. And um, again, much like I spoke about with uh, Dance of Death, the targets on this are just really good in the front end and you get pretty much six songs in a row that are really great and then you have a little bit of a lull with deja vu and then alexander the great closes it out um so the two lulls in this if i had to pick rolling this of the long distance runner is a bit of a low point in deja vu but the thing to contrast this with like number of the beast again is like the opener really grabs you and it's boom 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 boom, boom all the way down and it's pretty amazing honestly even if you were to sit here and i'm criticizing this kind of harshly and saying there's a lull with flowing this long distance runner and deja vu but just because the caliber of those songs isn't on par with the rest of the record in my opinion they're they're slightly lesser than the rest, the other six songs on the album, but they are still pretty damn good, and they're pretty solid. Like I said, they're in that seven and a half, seven category at worst, seven. Um, so I mean, still pretty decent songs, passable songs. So this record is really listenable, and I think that's a good mark on the band to show you that hey, look, this record is really listenable. Somewhere in Time really, really does that. Uh, it's a very extremely listenable album. I'm listening to this thing in its entirety all the way through. There's nothing that I think... Like I said, it's it's easy to listen to, too, because where the song positionings are in the record, they're almost easy to overlook, because even though they're a step down from some of the other songs, they still flow really well together. And uh, this might be the first album where the entire album actually flows perfectly from beginning to end. It's just those little lulls with... Not even really lulls, just like I said, just a little bit lesser songs than the others. And that's why Somewhere in Time is where it is. Now, moving on from Somewhere in Time... We're going to stay in the 80s, and we're going to look at Peace of Mind. Now, Peace of Mind, much like I said with Somewhere in Time, is completely listenable. It's just one of those records, and even when I talked about with Power Slave to a certain extent, I mean, super listenable. There's, you know, there might be kind of a lull on those albums. But not enough, like, when I talked about Book of Souls, like, Tears of a Cloud and Man of Sorrows are, like, you know, clear, definitive lulls. Like, they're low points to the record. 
when we talk about like Power Slave or Somewhere in Time, those records have these kind of like subtle laws where a song isn't quite as on par with, you know, the majority of the songs on the record or the really good songs on the record, but that's what makes them so powerful. Um, Peace of Mind, much like Power Slave or Somewhere in Time, in terms of an 80s album, I think it is the most listenable Bruce era 80s record that Iron Maiden has ever turned out. I mean, it just... Where Eagles Dare from the beginning and the get-go just sucks you in. Revelations is an incredible song. Flight of Icarus is super catchy. Die With Your Boots On is super catchy. You get the infamous, one of the most renowned Maiden songs ever in the Trooper after that. Just a beautiful, amazing, iconic song. Into Still Life, which is very interesting and powerful and invigorating into a lot of people criticize this song but quest for fire it's very catchy it's very interesting it's very unique it's probably the weakest song on the album but for a weak song on this record it's pretty strong into sun and still which is great and then the closer the amazing to tame a land based on frank herbert's dune novel i mean peace of mind is a complete album from top to bottom and when I talked about earlier in this podcast about you're going to see what I mean when I talk about listenability and song groupings. Peace of Mind is a record where the song grouping is the entire album. It's like, boom, here's Peace of Mind. Listen to it from beginning to end. And you can. And you can do that with, you know, a Power Slave for the most part and Somewhere in Time for the most part, but not on the level that you can do with Peace of Mind. It's just that record that from beginning to end in terms of a listenability standpoint, I think this is the first record that I wouldn't change or wish that, you know, Bruce sang on it like Lost for Words Big Aura because it has everything that I want. It already has everything. It has the full package, the real deal. It's nine songs that are just incredible. Nine incredible, magnificent, powerful songs. And this is why in the podcast, when I said if I was going to get a maid, somebody into Maiden, like a friend, or and I have gotten people into Maiden, by having them listen to Peace of Mind, and then we'll talk about the next album, but this one in particular, it's the whole package. Listenability, a flawless 10 out of 10. Are all the songs 10s? No. But this album, these songs, like the thing about this record is I don't think any of these songs really fall below a seven and a half or a seven and 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 the echelon is above that you know the majority of the songs on peace of mind are in that nine nine and a half level and they're that good and that's why this entire album is completely listenable like absolutely phenomenal and just the way it's structured and layered and where they place the songs like i just talked about when i talked about the record it's unfathomable and uh, having seen live you know the majority of these songs i've seen more eagles dare i've seen revelations i've seen flight of icarus i've seen the trooper those four you know half the record pretty much live i mean they just they just really hit home this album is unbelievable and uh a lot of people and what matt and i talk about this on the podcast because you know Dave Murray is Matt's favorite guitarist in the band, and I love Davey too, but Adrian's my favorite. And those two albums we just talk about, Somewhere in Time and Peace of Mind, so close to each other because they're overshadowed by Power Slave and what Power Slave was and is because of those tandems I talked about. But if you're looking at it from a full album listenability standpoint, those two records, I think you know, in my opinion, are more listenable than Power Slave just because of that loss for words. It breaks up the flow. Whereas, like I said, with Somewhere in Time and Peace of Mind, you can just go from beginning to end, not wish that Bruce was singing on an instrumental because there isn't one, then you can just digest the albums in their entirety. And I that's what I love about these two records. And that's why, in terms of a listenability standpoint, like I said, I feel like they're stronger that way than Power Slave. I'm not saying they're better than Power Slave, but... From listenability from beginning to end, 
they are just more complete listenability wise the way the songs flow and they're structured now granted like i said the strength for power slave is those tandems and aces high two minutes and then the closer power closers power slave and rhyme you know you don't really get that with uh somewhere in time or peace of mind you know somewhere in time has an amazing opener and caught somewhere in time and an amazing closer with aces or alexander the great excuse me Peace of Mind has the amazing opener where Eagles Dare and the great closer to Tame a Land. So it's only one of each. You don't really get that cool tandem like you do with Power Slave. But with that tandem aside, you know, I feel like the songs in the middle on some of these records are just a little bit more interesting and powerful. Like I said, the big four on Power Slave is what makes Power Slave a 10 out of 10. The big four. But Peace of Mind is an underrated album as is somewhere in time those two are absolutely amazing i just think peace of mind is a little bit better constructed because on somewhere in time you get that like i said not quite a lull but just low this is a long distance runner then you get deja vu you know a little bit later whereas peace of mind like listening to it and playing in my head it, it just flows perfectly it flows immaculately there is no other way you could have put these songs in order on this thing i mean it's just it's an incredible record and it's super strong that way and um that's why it is where it's at in terms of listenability one of the greatest one of the greatest albums in maiden's catalog and one that's often never looked like i said just because of uh, Number of the Beast, the new album with Bruce when he came in the band, and Power Slave. And it's almost like stuck in the middle, and then same thing with Somewhere in Time. It comes after the Gargantuan Power Slave, so it's like, you know, it's just caught in between two iconic albums, and it's often overlooked, but it shouldn't be because it's just as good. And in terms of song groupings and target songs, and how the album flows. This is damn near one of the best. And if it wasn't for these next couple. When I talk about groupings in particular. Uh, you're going to see with the top two. But we're going to go to number three. And number three. On this list of song groupings. For me. Is Brave New World. Brave New World. To echo pretty much everything I said about Peace of Mind. It's very similar that way. It's Wicker Man and a Ghost of the Navigator in the Brave New World, in the Blood Brothers, in a Mercenary, in a Dream of Mirrors, Fallen Angel, Nomad, Outside Planet, and Thin Line Between Love and Hate. This thing, much like Peace of Mind, is like, where's the tandems and the song groupings at? And it's like, well, the whole album is just an amazing grouping. It's like if you're looking at a target, I used this analogy earlier in the podcast. If you're shooting a gun at a target, almost all of these songs land within the outer ring of the bullseye or within the bullseye. And that's how Peace of Mind was, too. You know, not so much with Somewhere in Time. There were, you know, a couple songs that were not quite on that outer outer ring of the bullseye, just a little bit below that. Still close, but not quite as good as Peace of Mind or Brave New World. This is one of those records where everything just lands damn near perfect on that. Like Matt and I used the analogy before, and I'll say it again throwing darts at a dartboard they're throwing darts at this dartboard and those darts are hitting like damn near the bullseye every time so the one thing about brave new world though is the songs are in that like i said outer ring in the bullseye or in the bullseye brave new world might have one song that's actually a 10 out of 10 in the bullseye and i think that's blood brothers the thing about this record though is that every other song on here is like a 9 out of 10 for the most part or at at the least an 8 and a half I, like this record is just that good i mean wicker man is such a strong opener and it's, it's so powerful and it's like adrian smith's back in the band and he's rocking and he's shredding into this amazing ghost of the navigator very cerebral enchanting haunting heavy song brave new world again heavy but melodic and ambient at the same time Blood Brothers, to echo everything. I mean, I could go on with this record. The thing about this record is, and the hardest thing to rank this in terms of an album ranking standpoint is, it lacks a true epic. 
to the level like I talked about with like Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or To Tame a Land or Alexander the Great or Seven Son of a Seventh Son or Phantom of the Opera or Hallowed Be Thy Name. You know, it, it doesn't have, and it, even on the newer stuff like uh, uh, When the Wild Wind Blows or Star Blind uh, or Passchendaele or Dance of Death or the Red and the Black or Empire of the Clouds, stuff like that doesn't really have something that caliber. The closest thing that comes to that is Blood Brothers. The rest of the album is just these, you know, lengthier middle rangers or pushing into that epic category, but they never quite reach that full gear of epicness. It's just the songs are just so damn good throughout that they all are amazing when you listen to them. Are they epic in the sense of like what I talked about with those previous songs I just mentioned? I don't think so. I think, the, like I said, I think the one that comes close to that is Blood Brothers. But this album is solid. And if you were to take this and compare it to an album in the 80s, I would compare it to Peace of Mind. Like I said, because it's just, it's an album you can say, here, listen to this, put it in. And like I said, when I talked about Peace of Mind, I have gotten people into the band Iron Maiden by handing them a copy of peace of mind and a copy of brave new world and said listen to these albums and they listen to it and they're like i didn't skip a song that's that's the strength of these two records and then when you start to get into the you know you become more of a maiden fan you get into the deeper cuts you get into the more epic stuff you start to appreciate the the complexity of some of their some of their work and their songs you can see where i'm coming from too and why these two aren't at the very very top why peace of mind and brave new world aren't at the very very top because the songs, although they are all excellent and amazing, they they do kind of lack that epic quality that some of these 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 top two albums I'm going to talk about have. Where, like I said earlier, when I talked about Book of Souls and I was getting into it, you get like three or four Rhyme of the Ancient Mariners. You get like three or four epics on an album. You don't really get that with Brave New World or Peace of Mind. You might get one or two. Right. In terms of peace of mind, you get to tame a land. In terms of brave new world, you get blood brothers. So you don't get that full composite. And some of those other ones, like you get more epics on some of the earlier stuff I talked about, but the way they were categorized or the way they were grouped together in the track listing was just off, in my opinion, and it didn't give you that same kind of flow. This is like I said when you're pointing the gun on a target and you're shooting at the range how many songs can you get close to that bullseye and I feel like the groupings for Peace of Mind and Brave New World are some of the strongest some of the strongest and um, that's why Brave New World is where it is just a phenomenal album all the supplemental stuff that came with it Rock and Rio and all those things like Rock and Rio is amazing uh, it's the first Maiden concert I ever saw and it holds a special place in my heart just because it's based on the Brave New World record. My brother loves Brave New World. It's his favorite album. I, I knew a couple uh, people in college. Uh, Dustin, a kid I used to hang out with, he loved Brave New World. There's a couple other people I know who love Brave New World. It's their favorite records. Uh, friends I used to work with, they love Brave New World. Uh, it's it's a really strong album. Some people you know, say this is their favorite album, and... Rightfully so. It's the first album with the band as a six-piece, and it's a very solid, strong album. And I can't say it's a return to form either, because it's not. The 90s were hard for every metal band, right? Or every rock band. This is an evolution, and it's a new Maiden, and it's an amazing Maiden. And this is, like, the foundation of it. And that's why it's so powerful, too. It does have that kind of 80s feel, like I said, very similar to Peace of Mind with its... With its uh, with it being just a solid record throughout. But then again, they take this formula and just enhance it with these next two records I'm going to talk about. And uh, we're going to dive into them right now. So the last two records that we're going to talk about. Senjutsu is the next one. The latest record that came out in 2021. Grouping-wise, this is why this thing is just incredible to me. It starts off with Senjutsu, Into Strategio, Into Writing on the Wall, Into Lost in a Lost World. Those four in a row, much like I said with Brave New World and Peace of Mind, are in that outer ring of the bullseye. They're very, very close. 
Then you get Days of Future Past, The Time Machine, and Darkest Hour, which again are just slightly below that, almost like somewhere in time. It would be like, you know, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner or Deja Vu level kind of stuff, right? Maybe a little bit better than that. But here's where this thing shines. After that, you get Death of the Celts, The Parchment, and How on Earth. And when I talked about epics, that's what I'm talking about right there. You literally get three Rime of the Ancient Mariner level songs to close out the record. So when I talked about tandems with like Power Slave, Aces High and Two Minutes to Midnight, and then closing it with Power Slave and Rime of the Ancient Mariner, with this you're getting Senjutsu, which is almost an epic in itself at the beginning, Stratego and Writing on the Wall. Those three songs in particular just flow incredibly into each other. Absolutely incredibly into each other. It's it's insane. And when I saw Iron Maiden on the Legacy of the Beast tour in 2022, when they added the Senjutsu realm to the Legacy of the Beast set, and they wanted to play some songs from Senjutsu, they played the first three from the record. In concession, like you were listening to the album, and they just flowed incredibly together. I mean, absolutely phenomenally together. When I put this record in and I listened to it, I didn't, it, I didn't miss a beat. I listened to everything all the way through. Time Machine might be the weakest on this, and that might be the part that's a little bit of a lull. But like I said, you get literally three aces high, two minutes to mini, yeah, two minutes to mini, two minutes to midnight like songs at the beginning with Senjutsu Shichiga writing on the wall. Borderline, it, Senjutsu is like a mix between rhyme and, you know, two minutes, like, it's 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 a borderline epic, and then at the end, Death of the Celts, the Parchment, and Hell on Earth. I mean, some of the absolute most incredible, epic, progressive, long songs that Maiden has ever written, and they are just immense. Give me three rounds of the Ancient Mariners on every album, and you get that with this. You get that with Senjutsu again, a very cultural motif. Similar to Power Slave and similar to Book of Souls. Instead of this time, they're using Japanese culture, Japanese civilization, feudal Japan, that kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, uh, Egyptian culture or Mayan culture and civilization. And it's just incredible. Like, this record, I know I've been on a Senjutsu high for, I don't know, <laughs> two and a half years now since the album came out, and it... I, I mean, I don't think I'm coming down anytime soon. It's just, it's that damn good. It's that fucking good of an album. Like, take this and stack it up against the stuff from the 80s. And like I said, a lot of it is just so damn powerful. I talked about the parchment on earlier podcasts and how it's become one of my favorite modern-day Maiden songs. And it's true. The record is amazing. Listenability-wise, do I think in terms of a listenability and flow standpoint... It's as solid as like Brave New World or Peace of Mind. Eh, not necessarily. But I think the caliber of songs, the caliber of songs on this is just a notch above those records. And then the stuff that came before it, because you get more of them. Like I talked about, you get more epic stuff. You get, like I said, you're down at the range shooting a target. You're getting closer to the bullseye and the caliber of ammo you're using is putting a bigger hole in that target. It'd be like, you know, for, for all my gun aficionados out there, ammo guys out there. It'd be like taking a 9mm and shooting, you know, a bullseye with it. Or taking, you know, a forty four mag and shooting a bullseye with it, right? The hole is just bigger. Like, you're hitting more of that target with the caliber. And that's what this record does. It has that forty four mag, you know, caliber of songs on here with those last three in particular. Death of the Celts, Parchment, How on Earth. Parchment is incredible. I mean, it's it's one of my favorite Iron Maiden songs of all time. And this is the newest record. So that tells you how much I love this record. And I, I love this album. And I love the band. And I love Epic Maiden. Like I said, this is the reason why. And moving on from Senjutsu, we'll go to the last, the last album. In my opinion, it has the best song groupings of any Maiden album ever. And again, I'll say this again. You're taking the ammunition and you're taking it a step up. All right, this is like a 50 Magnum, right? 50 caliber mag. 
right? The hole is just even bigger now when you're shooting the target. And this thing is a matter of life and death. Amazing stack and run of openers at the beginning. Different World might not be the best opener. I don't think it's as good as Wicker Man. I don't think it's as good as If Eternity Should Fail. I don't think it's as good as Senjutsu, right? But it has this drawing power that captivates you and draws you in from the beginning. And it segues perfectly into these Colors Don't Run. Then into this, the heaviest song Maiden has ever done, in my opinion, and Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. Into the catchy swiftness and just melodic, folky sound of the Pilgrim. So those four openers are just incredible. Now here's where the album has a little bit of a lull. Those four in a row are right on par with that outer ring, like I said. Then you get Longest Day, Out of the Shadows, a little bit of a step down. You're you're kind of drifting off a little bit. You're not in that outer ring of the bullseye anymore. You might be in the ring below that, right? Now here's where this album makes up for it. Much like I said with Senjutsu, you get three Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner like epics at the end. With this one, you get four. You get four epic songs to close out the record. And literally, when you're shooting a target in terms of song groupings in this, you are blowing a hole through the bullseye. And those four songs that blow a hole straight through the bullseye and honestly knock this target off the post, right? Knock it off whatever you're shooting at are the reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg, For the Greater Good of God, Lord of Light, and the, the amazing closer, The Legacy. This, this record, it's so hard for me to convey how much it means to me because, yes, there is a nostalgia factor here for me with this. But the groupings of these songs... And the way that this album is constructed. And yeah, you have two that maybe aren't quite as powerful as the other eight on the album. And The Longest Day and Out of the Shadows. But, man. Like I said, when I rank this stuff. Give me an album with three, four, five Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner-like songs. And this is what you get. You get A Matter of Life and Death. This is the only album, in my opinion, that's done that with an amazing stack of closers. And the second closest to that to me would be Senjutsu for me, right? So, like, I can't convey enough how much this record is just phenomenal. And they did a really cool thing here because they put Brighter Than a Thousand Suns very close to the beginning, too. So, honestly, it's like five... Five of the ten songs on this are epic. Then you have a couple that are like middle range rockers that are really solid and really good. You know, like eight, eight and a halfers. But those five epics, I mean, you're talking about nine and a half, tens for the most part for all of them. I, I, it's, it's an incredible album. And yes, Matt and I both gave A Matter of Life and Death a ten out of ten. And some people might not think it's a 10 out of 10. I personally think it is. You get... If we're talking about epics in Maiden as a progressive metal band and a band that is writing longer songs now, this is the prime example of that. This is the record that does everything that I want it to do. For me... Not only is this the heaviest Maiden album, in my opinion, the darkest Maiden album, in my opinion, I think it might be the most ambitious album in terms of what they did. Is it the longest? No. This is a single album. But the way it's constructed, the length of the songs, it might not be as long as some of the later stuff that came out after the fact. But I'll say this. For what it is, and for what it means, it's just a phenomenal record because of those epics. Legacy, and I know I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, 
Legacy might be one of the best lyrical songs that Iron Maiden has ever done. I can't think of anything better than that. I can't. I think it's incredible just the message it sends and how powerful it is. I, I and and the entire record, like I said, it's kind of in its own little niche with war and religion, but the way it's done thematically, it might be the best thematic record they've ever done. And, you know, Senjutsu and Book of Souls, I think, come close to that. So, with that being said, this is the best song grouping. This is the the best, most unique, most interesting, most powerful song grouping for me. Like I said, this literally destroys the bullseye in terms of a song grouping. And I just think it's incredible. So, that's it. That's uh, episode 26 of A Manner of Life and Maiden. Uh, the Podcast of the Beast. I am Joe Labriola. If you get a chance to see Iron Maiden out there on the Future Pass Tour this year, make sure you're going to check them out. I'll be seeing them in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on November 8th of this year, and I'm so pumped to see that. I hope they don't change the set, but uh, I'll be getting to see some Senjutsu stuff and some Somewhere in Time stuff, so I'm excited. Listening to this episode, you know that those two albums are super listenable, and they're they're fantastic, and they're, they're amazing. I hope everybody... Uh, Stay safe out there and uh, up the irons. Take care of yourselves. Talk to you soon. Hey everybody, this is the afterthought section of episode 26 for A Matter of Life and Maiden, the podcast of the Beast. That was created by Matt Wagner and myself, Joe Labriola. Uh, I just wanted to talk about episode 26 for a few minutes here and uh, just talk about how difficult it was for me to sit there and go through best song groupings. Um... And even looking back on it, these things are things that fluctuate, I mean, really on a daily, weekly, monthly, you know, annual basis for me when I go back and listen to some of these, some of these albums and uh, in the, in the vast catalog of Iron Maiden's uh, discography. But it's, it's so cool because for the most part, I will say that I do pretty much tend to stay the same with how I rank things, but I do catch myself, um, changing things up sometimes so initially going back and going through uh where i placed like um iron maiden and then i think i went into seventh son i think it was after that i had a completely different album in that slot and then i went back and i was listening to songs and listening to the records and i was like man i i gotta switch some things around and uh it's just cool when you when you catch yourself with those little things so it's uh, super interesting to me, and I love it. Yeah, and with that being said, I mean, I think it's super interesting to do this and just kind of, like, go through these different ideas with Maiden stuff and, like, topics about Iron Maiden. I think it's really cool. Um, I think I've said this in the podcast before, uh, or I've mentioned it, or Matt mentioned it earlier when we started this thing back in 2018, uh, in the summer of 2018, you know, when Matt and I used to hang out, and we got together, and we started, you know, thinking about this, you know, when we were younger, and we were kids, like, in our, in our teens, like, you know, 18, 19, and we got into metal, and started really getting into uh, heavy music, like Maiden, and Metallica, and Megadeth, and Sabbath, and Rainbow, and, you know, more stuff along those lines, and those similar veins, Dio, um, it's just, you know, one thing, and Matt said this in a quote in here, I'll say it again, one thing that he said was, there's a lot of things that I'm passionate about, because we're both historians too, right? We're both historians, we both like fantasy books and fantasy movies and literature, we both like science fiction, we both are very similar that way, um, like similar bands, similar music, we have similar hobbies, similar interests, but um, the one thing that Matt said was, is you know, the one thing I've been passionate about for a decade, it was at that point a decade, when we were hanging out one time, he was like, is Iron Maiden. 
and I said this in the podcast before. I mean, I'm a I'm a history instructor. You know, I could I could teach an entire 15 week lecture on Iron Maiden, and the great thing about it would be is you know I could do it every semester, and it would be different and change all the time. It's just something that's ever evolving, and they have such a rich history that it's awesome to do these podcasts. So. If anybody has any ideas of something they'd like me to pursue or talk about or make an episode about, please put it in the comment section below. Uh, I I know that I've been doing some kind of off the cuff stuff here. This is this is like one of the first ones, like best song groupings. I kind of just came up with it one day. I was trying to figure out what kind of artwork to make, and I ended up finding the you know the artwork for this the uh, the sniper and the soldier, and it really fit into like the matter of life and death cover and the whole idea of the World War II motif, and then. I started thinking about targets and bullseyes and and groupings of, you know, going to the range and shooting. Because, uh, you know, I, I do that as well. I used to work in law enforcement. And uh, those are the things I do as well. So that, for me, is super interesting. And if anybody has any ideas of what they might think would be cool, please let me know. But, uh, yeah, this has been the afterthought section. This is the first time I did it. This is the first episode I did it on. And I think I might just start attaching this to the end of... Uh, episodes moving forward because I think it's a really cool piece after the main episode uh, takes place so I really appreciate everybody's support I really appreciate everybody listening to A Matter of Life and Made in the Podcast of the Beast everybody take care of yourselves out there have a good day